Very pleased to be uh, welcoming back a former fellow, Beth Bailey, a historian from Temple University, to launch her book, America's Army, The Making of the All-Volunteer Force. Um, before introducing Beth and our commentators, let me just briefly say something about the Wilson Center for those of you who haven't been here before. Um, as many of you may know, um, the Wilson Center was conceived as a living memorial to Woodrow Wilson, and it um, is based on a, a conception of his life as a, as, a, as a person who embodied in himself both scholarship and public policy. And as in Wilson's life, the center is um, designed to be a place where academic in endeavors and research and studies and so forth, scholarship, come together with public policy and the people who make public policy, may, uh, public policy. And that kind of discourse, that kind of dialogue is something that we really uh, foster here and hope will thrive. And today's uh, program, I think, is a very good example of that. Um, Beth Bailey, the author of today's book, is one of the leading historians of the 20th, uh, 20th century United States. Throughout her career, she has covered many of the major themes in not just in American history, but perhaps in life. She writes about love and war. Uh, her books include um, uh, uh, From Front Door to From Front Porch to Back Seat, Courtship in America, uh, Sex in the Heartland, um, and now today's book, America's Army. She's also written a major textbook in American history, and uh, with her husband David Farber, has also written and edited a lot of books on America in the 60s. So she's really a major interpreter of uh, American life in the 20th century and especially in the post-war period. Commenting on her book, we are very fortunate to have with us two other scholars and, um, and writers who also embody these large themes. Um, Judith Steem, uh, one of our commentators, um, teaches political science at Florida International University, where she also served as a provost and academic vice president for four years, and she uh, she writes not on love and war, but war and peace. She has written books on women in the military, and her most recent book is entitled Champions for Peace, Women Winners of the Nobel Prize. Uh, our second commentator will be Lawrence Korb, who's a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and who has worked in the Defense Department. Um, he's also written many, many books and many, many articles and made many um, uh, public, uh, public appearances in, in the media. Um, his books inc include uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, our first 25 years, the first 25 years, um, and the rise and fall of the Pentagon, and a number of other books that are listed on your bio. So um, I think we're going to have a very rich discussion. I've asked Professor Bailey to lay out her books, the major themes in her book, and to talk about, give us some background and uh, uh, the writing about it, writing of it, how she went about the research, and so forth. And then we'll call, I'll call on Professor Steam and Dr. Korb to um, comment on the book. So each of them will have about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussion. And then please join us afterwards for a reception uh, outside the door. So thank you very much. Welcome, Beth Bailey. Welcome back. <laughs> thank you, Sonia. Uh, it's, it's really, do you want to come here? Can, can you Go hear? On? The podium? Sure. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Sonia. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here and to be back here because this is where I actually began this project. And uh, the, the Wilson Center had an enormous impact on the shape of the project. It began primarily as a cultural analysis, and my experience here made me understand very clearly that I needed to spend a lot of time paying attention to the institution of the Army and to thinking a good deal about the ways in which um, policy shaped the decisions about moving to an all-volunteer force and also the ways in which an all-volunteer force had significant policy implications. But in 2005, when I came here, still very much at the beginning of the project, I wasn't quite aware of how big a jump it was going to be from my previous research. Now, you know, sex in the heartland and a history of dating, it should be pretty clear that talking about the Army is going to be a big leap, but it hadn't quite sunk in yet. Um, you know, the, the truism that history is a foreign country seemed pretty persuasive to me, and I had written a book with my husband about Hawaii under martial law during World War II that focused an awful lot on the red light district of um, Hotel Street, which is definitely very far from my own personal experience. 
Um, and I had written a book that really set, centered on a kind of macho, drug suffused counterculture in Lawrence, Kansas, which was maybe not quite so far from my experience, but not, not quite um, common either. But my sense of confidence <coughs> about this new project evaporated very suddenly when I sort of dived into the primary sources and found myself hitting full speed the wall of army acronymsy. <laughs> now, this language was more foreign than I had anticipated, and I spent a lot of time on the internet looking up acronyms to try and figure out what they meant. But they also created a great sense of unease about having to have conversations with anyone. So this prompted my most vivid anxiety dream in my life. And professors almost always have an anxiety dream at the beginning of every semester as we start to teach new classes. Um, my, my dream was I was at the Friday afternoon reception where people mingle and talk about their projects. And I'm standing there, it's very lovely. I'm, I'm talking to Lee Hamilton and to uh, a general in uniform, and I am conversing fluently in Army acronym. I, I am very <laughs> proud of myself. This is going swimmingly, and all of a sudden I come to one that I've seen written but I've never heard anybody pronounce. And I remember it vividly, it was uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, Manpower and Reserve Affairs. And I, I, I panic, I, I panic, and in my dream I'm suddenly standing there in the middle of the Wilson Center completely naked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and not quite sure what to do, because nobody else seems to notice. Uh, and after that, I realized what a big step I was taking my research, <laughs> continued on. So four and a half years later, I stand here with the book completed uh, and want to talk just a little bit about what I had in mind for this project and give you a quick overview of uh, my argument and what I think some of its implications are. I wrote the book really for three audiences. Uh, the first audience obviously is for historians. Historians have uh, started moving into writing military history among those of us who are not primarily military historians. And US historians have also started paying more attention to the history of institutions these days. But one of the reasons I think this work is important for the field of history is because the historians who have traditionally over the past two or three decades been really interested in the process of social change and the ways in which Americans have sought and battled over questions of social equality um, have almost completely ignored the military. And I think that such an important, large, powerful, central institution needs to be put into that set of questions and equations. And so that's one of the main things I was attempting to do in terms of affecting the historiographical literature. Um, secondly, I'm trying to write for the general public, at least the general public that will either read serious nonfiction or those, the general public that will read articles written by journalists who will now possibly call me and ask for a quote when they're working on a story that has something to do with the all-volunteer force. In large part because I think what's happened, one of the side effects of moving to an all-volunteer force is that fewer Americans have any direct or somewhat close knowledge of the military today. Uh, in the mid-1950s, the majority of adult males were veterans. Now it's less than 13 percent, and only three million American men and women are veterans since 1990. Now that's in part for very happy reasons. We haven't fought a ground war with the mass army, but it's also because of the shift to the all-volunteer force and the smaller military that we uh, maintain. But What's happened is that a more self-contained, smaller segment of American society is likely to join the military today, and the rest of American society is much less likely to have any direct or semi-direct contact with the military, and I think that it's a great problem that so much of American society doesn't know much about how the military functions or what it's expected to do, other than what it sees on the evening news or for those people who read, um, read from journalists. And the third piece of this, um, I'm hoping, is a little bit for the military. Internal studies uh, of the institution of the Army are painstaking, careful, and excellent in terms of policy, but rarely are situated in the broader currents of American society. And I think that that's what I bring here. I'm a historian who's much more broadly trained and more able to think about the ways in which these decisions, the policy decisions, the, the decisions about the ways in which uh, men and women are recruited and trained and um, the conditions of their deployment are created in part by broader questions and broader circumstances in contemporary American society over the past three, four decades. 
So today, very quick overview of the book and my argument. I start in 1968, um, which despite the kind of not odd nostalgia for the era, was a very, very difficult year. Um, beginning with Tet in early winter, which showed Americans that the government had not been completely forthcoming about the prospects of the U.S. and Vietnam. The assassination of Martin Luther King, the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, uh, enormous levels of division and anger in America, which leads to tanks in the streets of Chicago by August. At this moment, in October 1968, Richard Nixon goes on the radio two weeks before the presidential election, and at the height of the commitment of American ground troops in Vietnam, promises that he will end the draft. Now, this is a doozy of a promise, and um, a very Nixon-esque promise as well. He obviously didn't mean to end the draft until U.S. troops were withdrawn from Vietnam. Um, but what he was trying to do was to show that he was a bold thinker. And he was trying, in a fundamental way, to pull the legs out from under war protest, which both he and LBJ cast largely as anti-draft protest and not just anti-war protest. Now, his move was possible because there was essentially a perfect storm of opposition to the draft at this moment. Um, many people, both left and right, looked at the draft and understood that it was not functioning in a fashion that was equitable and fair. Um, many people, uh, many liberals looked at the, the war in Vietnam and thought that if perhaps a move was made to a volunteer force, it would make it much more difficult for American presidents to engage in what they understood as military adventurism, um, a, a prediction that didn't work out so well. Um, and then there were a large number of Americans, conservatives, libertarians, who saw liberty as the highest good and saw government enforced conscription as a fundamental betrayal of American principles. Now, all of these reasons and the chaos that surrounded this moment led to the possibility of ending the draft, but what underlay the move fundamentally were the arguments of a group of free market economists who made the case that the army, the military, could not continue to be protected from the market, and that by turning to the market, we would solve the problems, the failures of government-enforced conscription. Now, this notion of turning to the market uh, was resisted by the army who, which, and the rest of the military, which felt that military service is not simply any old job. Um, but. And the move to the market was never quite that simple, but what did happen with the move to the volunteer force is that the Army was put into the marketplace. And so in my book, what I'm trying to do is to trace the struggles here, the discussions here, and then the implications of this move, because this shift to the marketplace <coughs> in fundamental ways creates new opportunities and problems, and it shapes the possible solutions, and it also reinvigorates a whole set of ongoing old questions that animate discussions about military service. Who should serve and on what terms? What's the meaning of military service? What's the proper place of the military in American life? It's all complicated, too, because the initial shift to the market comes at a very specific time in U.S. history, the early 1970s. I used to say that it was the worst possible time to move to an all-volunteer force um, until somebody said, well, you know, it could have been right before the U.S. is contemplating invading Japan at the end of World War II, um, and that kind of gave me a better point of reference. <laughs> but nonetheless, it was a very bad time. The Army is in crisis internally. The Army is acknowledging that it's in crisis. There's a crisis of leadership. There's a crisis of morale. There's rampant drug abuse. There is prevalent indiscipline. The Army is struggling with its own stability and its own future. And culture, in many ways, is profoundly anti-military. Uh, some of you here remember uh, the phrase, question authority. It was not uh, a youth culture that bent easily to the notions of military discipline. Um, and in general, the Army of all the four services was ranked at the bottom. 70% of Army veterans said that if they were asked to recommend for one of the people they cared about which service to join, they would recommend the Army last. These are Army veterans, so uh, you know the Air Force certainly is not going to recommend you join the Army. At this moment, the Army, the least favored service, the biggest service, is going to have to try and convince 20 to 30,000 young men, men here, a month <coughs> to join the Army. 
The goal for this past fiscal year was 65,000 for the year, 20 to 30 a month. How are they going to do it? One thing they did, which was critical, was internal reform. The, the Army did a lot of hard thinking and reform and recasting. But the other thing that it did was to think about how to deal with the notion of the market and to recast understanding of the market. And here I just have two major points. It wasn't simply, they said, just a labor market. It wasn't simply a matter of making pay equivalent to entry-level civilian jobs and young men and women would flock to the Army. They had to think of this market as a more sophisticated market that incorporates a consumer market. So the Army launches very sophisticated, state-of-the-art research to try and understand what it is that young people want and then sell it back to them in the form of the Army. And the second thing that the Army had to do was to pay attention to these market-driven patterns of enlistment and the challenges it created. Um, they found themselves in the 70s drawing those people with fewer options, which meant in large part they had a way over enrollment proportionally of poor African American men. Um, and the second thing they tried to do was to figure out how to use calculated benefits to attract the people they wanted to join and also to rethink the roles of those who had not been fully tapped by Army enlistment processes. And here we're talking uh, to a great deal about women. They decided in all sorts of complicated policy discussions that the way to do this was to frame the Army not as an obligation, not as an obligation of male citizenship, but instead as, as an opportunity. This creates all sorts of other complications. If the Army is indeed an opportunity, how can the United States reject those who need the opportunity most? How can it not offer this wonderful opportunity? And there were actually many benefits that came with Army service, especially in a period of relatively extended peace, to those people who need it most, to those people who have the biggest trouble finding jobs, to those people who um, find the least opportunities in civilian society. Um, this becomes an enormous struggle in the policy world of the 1970s as by the late 1970s and early 1980s, the Army is discovering in part through some miscalculations that uh, a full half of enlisted soldiers go score in category four, the next to bottom quintile, uh, not quintile, but on the bell curve. And um, a study at Fort Benning found that an enormous percentage of soldiers couldn't read above fifth grade level. I trace the move, the solutions they come up with, the move to stability, the kinds of successes they find, um, which come about in part because of learning lessons of management and come about in part because of rethinking what roles people can play. And in the post-1970s, I try and talk about the way in which the Army tries to position itself in American society. The all-volunteer force shapes the demographics of the Army. Uh, soldiers are more likely to be women, they're mo more likely to be older, and they're definitely more likely to be married and have children. This has an impact on the deployability of the force. In the post-Cold War era, before we realized uh, after 9-11 that uh, the military force was uh, s still useful when people were talking about the end of history and um, that there were <coughs> jokes going around that we're running out of enemies. Uh, there was a sense of it trying to sell the Army because of the domestic social good it brought about. The Army, in many ways, offers equal opportunity. It is the dream of inclusion in American society. This is a way to sell the American public on the good that the Army does, even in times of peace. Um, and finally, um, in this, this recasting, there's a chapter that I wrote about the move to the warrior ethos, which is so prevalent today and how that rises before 9-11, before the current conflicts and wars, as an attempt um, on the part of many people who are very uncomfortable with the ways in which the Army is positioning itself and with the changing demographic composition of the Army looking over their shoulders at the Marines as a way to try and recraft and recreate the identity of the soldier and to reposition the identity of the Army well before 9-11 and the current crises. Finally, um, what people tend to ask me with this book is what my policy prescription is about the AVF versus the draft. And um, that's not what I was trying to do. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, if, if I can dare a prediction, and that's always a dangerous thing to do, we're not going back to the draft short of some kind of massive world conflagration. Um, there's a lack of political will and the military in general, though, um, 
con quite concerned about how stressed uh, all branches of the military are in today's climate with the size that they are, um, really does favor the AVF and the ways in which the volunteer force has been successful. My concern and my, uh, if, I don't know if it's policy, but at least uh, the implications of the move to all volunteer force though, to me, is that it has allowed a small percentage of Americans not only to carry the burden of war, but to have the immediate investment in these decisions. Too many Americans, because there is no threat of a draft, because there is nothing that forces them to be engaged in these weighty decisions that the nation must make, are able to step aside and not really take a position, excuse me, one way or another on these issues. And so while I'm not saying we need to return to the draft in order to force Americans to pay attention, what I am saying is that this is a significant implication of the move to the all-volunteer force and something that we as a nation need to pay more attention to. Thanks. Thank you, Beth. Um, Judith, if you, we use the podium because it's being taped. Do okay. You, yeah, right okay. there? Yes, you're next. Oh. I thought I was going to be third and Larry Corb Sorry. would steal all of my topics, but I get to go ahead of him. Uh, the first book I ever wrote was on nonviolent philosophy. And the way I got to the military was saying thesis, antithesis. And once I started doing research on the military, I really haven't stopped. In fact, I now have a crusade, which you will approve of, which is to bring the topic of the military into the academy as a regular and routine part of any American government course, not just security studies or international relations. And I've, I've done a number of things related to that. Particularly like this book because I lived everything which was in it, be beginning with the anti-war protests in the 68 and then working with the military, being on Dakowitz. And I knew Larry Korb when he was in the Pentagon supervising Dakowitz and he jumped out of an airplane. <laughs> that was the thing I remember the most, that this guy decided that the most important thing to do was to show that as a civilian he really knew what was happening because he could parachute. I also was embarrassed to find that I've been teaching my students wrong because I have been telling them on the one hand that we got rid of the draft because of all the anti-war protesters wanted rid of it and the military wanted to get rid of all of the bad perform performers and as she points out, it was a libertarian. There was Milton <laughs> Anderson sitting in the White House. And, you know, I also have another lecture about the libertarians, but I never put the two together until I read your book, which now I will have to correct myself. I take very seriously what Michael Walzer wrote in Just and Unjust Wars, where he said that in a democracy, the citizen has a responsibility for what kind of military we have and how it is used. And that is really the message that I am trying to bring to political science. Now, of course, the kind of military we have is the all-volunteer force. This is a very good book. It's readable, it's important, but it's really about the army and the all-volunteer force. And you know, I have all sorts of things I want to know now as a result of reading your book, but of course, you couldn't do them all. Uh, it must have been very different for the Navy and for the Air Force. And the interesting thing would be how it has been for the Marines, whether they're small enough and warrior enough that they are always able to recruit. Whereas the Army doesn't have the glamour and the fancy machines and it has to recruit large numbers and it's dangerous for many of them. Uh, I think it's really been very well established the degree to which it's representative and who it represents. But one of the things which is not really considered is the expense. And so I was fascinated that yesterday for the first time really became a headline how much it was going to cost to put soldiers in the field in Afghanistan. The current estimate is one million dollars a year for each individual. And the all-volunteer force has really only been evaluated as to whether you can get people in and the quality of those people. But it's a very expensive proposition. So for instance, the recruiters have got a really tough job. But as I understand it, their job is to get one person in uniform a month. 
Imagine all the man hours and energy that goes into a recruitment to get one person. So it's expensive that way. It's also expensive because we shrunk the military down and now we know that we're paying a lot of people, civilian contractors, to do the military's jobs. Now, we know that now because we're trying to fight some wars, but even before that we were doing it. So for <laughs> instance, when we got into the all-volunteer force, we started hiring people to do the jobs like KP and kitchen duty and things like that, so that the contracting is enormous. And then in order to make it an opportunity, it becomes very expensive. I have a niece. This niece is 40 years old. She's not in good shape. She does have a college degree, but she's an alcoholic who not only got divorced but lost custody of her children because she was really not able to take care of them or herself. They paid her $40,000 to join and she's off in Iraq. So this is one of the quality issues. The other interesting thing is that the military thought that by putting a whole lot of important jobs into the reserves, we would never go to war without the reserves and that that would be a check on going to war. Well, people joined the reserves and they thought we won't have to go because during Vietnam the reserves didn't have to go. And so it was a big surprise to everybody when we did go to war and the reserve got called up. So you have, you do have citizen soldiers there. These people are weekend warriors, but on the other hand, they are people who are civilian soldiers, if you will. They are truly citizen soldiers. And at one point, at least, people from the reserves actually outnumbered regular military people in Iraq. I think it might have slipped below 50% now, but these, the people who are the genuine citizen soldiers are doing a lot of our fighting. Um, another kind of military we have is a very high-tech military. And that high-tech military, uh, see what I'm interested in is the different things which w might put a check on our, what the Council on Foreign Relations calls wars of choice. Um, high-tech military means that f in large part, until we tried to becoming an occupying force, we could kill with a great deal of impunity. And we're we're even going to be using drones instead of piloted planes, much to many of the people in the Air Force dismay. But now we have an occupying forces in countries where we didn't really conquer the country and get an unconditional surrender. So I think a lot of people thought the all-volunteer all force was perfectly appropriate for peacetime, but when the real war came, then we would have trouble. And what maybe what we have now is a middle-sized war. And so we ha can't quite go to the draft, but on the other hand, the all-volunteer force is being stretched beyond imagination. Um, I'm sh we all know about post-traumatic stress. We know about suicides. What we are asking of our citizen so soldiers may in fact be unconscionable, and also another element in the expense. Um, the draft, of course, was controversial because there were so many deferments. And one of the assignments I give my students is to say, okay, if we have to go back to the draft, who's going to be included, who's going to be excluded, what are the deferments going to be? And because I teach in Miami, where everybody knows that everything having to do with politics and government is corrupt, <laughs> it's very clear to them that we can call it a lottery, but that there will be the opportunity for people to get out who want to. I remember teaching at UCLA in, the, in 68. I had students who got out of the draft by having braces put on their teeth. So I think maybe I will let Larry continue. I don't have braces on my teeth. But <laughs> 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 we want to hear about the parachute. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great book. We had a preview of this up at Princeton last, uh, last fall. We did this. Let me uh, talk about a couple of things that I think are important to put this uh, into uh, context. 
when, don't forget, we weren't the first to go to the ABF. The British did it back in the 50s. And I think a lot of people forget that, and I think that that had an influence. In fact, we used to kid when I try to deal with this in the 80s where the problems were terrible because, it was, as Beth points out, some of the mistakes that were made uh, in the 70s when, when, we, <coughs> when we went there, but all the English-speaking peoples had an ABF, the British, the Canadians, the Australians, and the New Zealanders, whereas the continental countries uh, in, in, in Europe did not. They, had, they still had uh, conscription. In fact, I was asked to testify before the French Parliament when they decided to go to an AVF, and I said, I thought I'd never be here because you guys invented this thing, you know, and did it. But let me say a couple of things that I think are, are really important. <clears throat> I used to get asked the question a lot, well, you know, our future leaders aren't going to be in the military and all that with the AVF. It's not just the AVF, it's a smaller military. I mean, the Army is 540,000 or so people. We have a country of 300 billion. And, and if I said, well, you're going to go to Congress or you're going to go to the Supreme Court, then I you know, could draft you. But even if you went to a draft, you'd still get a very small amount of, of people. And again, I think that that's uh, important to, to keep in mind. Now, let me make my most important point here. And I, I can't emphasize this too much. The all-volunteer force had four pillars, OK? And I think it's very important. One was you'd have a comparatively small army. And I want to emphasize the Army, and I think that's the, you know, the, the point of this, this book, and I think it's really critical. I'll give you something from my own experience. <clears throat> Back in the 60s, I uh, was in graduate school and teaching high school in New York. So when I got my draft notice, I had two deferments. And uh, my father said to me, we don't have deferments in this house. You think you're better than the paper boy? I was the first in my generation to go to, uh, to college. Get down and join the Army. And I said, well, how about the Navy? Well, that's all right, too. But my feeling was the Army's tough, OK? And you know, I went down and I, I joined the Navy. I did not know the Navy flew. I ended up as a naval flight officer. But that's a whole you know, other issue. But the fact of the matter is that the other services basically never had the problem that the Army did. Now, a lot of people during the draft would join the Navy or the Air Force because they didn't want to go into the Army. In fact, we used to laugh all the time when they tell us, well, you're all volunteers. Well, yeah, technically speaking, but if there was no draft, would we, uh, would we have done that? So <clears throat> we would have a comparatively small active duty army. Now, why one cost, OK? We're now going to have to pay. I took a cut from my, to become an ensign in the Navy from what I was making as a New York City high school teacher in the 60s. And it wasn't a lot, but it was 220 bucks a month, OK? And I enlisted people got uh, $80, $80, $80 a month. So now you're going to have to pay market, market wages. And so therefore, it's going to be costly. Uh, second thing is, the Army has the toughest time recruiting. So we would keep it as small as we could. Now, the second pillar was that the Guard and Reserve would be a bridge to conscription. The Guard and Reserve would be, an, uh, would be a strategic reserve not an operational reserve as a bridge to conscription. Now, I'm not a historian, but I, if I hear one more time that General Abrams did this, it ain't true. He said he never said it, okay, <laughs> about the, the Guard and Reserve. Now, the reason Johnson didn't mobilize the Guard and Reserve <clears throat> during the 60s was because that's where all the draft dodgers were, okay? People joined the Guard and Reserve knowing they wouldn't go, and they were also, you know, the elites. President Bush, Senator Bradley. I mean, I, I mean, the thing I remember about Bradley, I mean, you know, and again, you, you lick this stuff. Bradley, of course, he goes to Princeton. Then he's a Rhodes Scholar, and he comes back, and he's going to get drafted. But he gets also drafted by the New York Knickerbockers, who want him to play. So how are we going to have him play if he's got to spend two years in the service? He gets into the New Jersey National Guard. Let me tell you, that was like winning the lottery in the late 60s. Everybody wanted to get into to the Guard, and conveniently, they let him do a six months training in the off season, okay? So this is what you would have confronted if you called up Guard and Reserve. So they didn't do it. They fought it with draftees, and anybody with a grain of salt could have beat the draft. We talked about it. And that's the elites were doing it. Look, President Obama came in. You know, it came of draft age. We already had an all-volunteer force. Bush gets in the Air National Guard again in the 60s. I mean. Come on, <laughs> the waiting list for this was incredible, okay? 
We all know with Clinton, you know, he joined the ROTC and then quit, you know, when he went, okay? And our last two vice presidents, okay? How old is Biden? Okay, <laughs> where was he? Well, he was married. And my favorite story, though, and I, it, I had something because I got involved with it, is one uh, Dick Cheney. In 1968, after having completed my service, I decided I'd like to get an APSA fellowship, American Political Science Association. Congressional Fellowship. So I go down, the meeting was here in Washington, and they say, you gotta go back to school, you've been out too long. There as I was in the service, okay. Well, I, okay, I went back to school <clears throat> and finished up my degree. 20 years later, the guy who told me that is working at Brookings and I'm his boss. Now, I didn't remember it, but he did. He thought I'm gonna throw him out the door. Yeah, that's <laughs> 20 years ago, I didn't remember. Uh, and, uh, but he tells me that one of the people that got it that year was Dick Cheney. Now, where had Cheney been? And so when Cheney uh, was Secretary of Defense, a reporter called me and asked me if I thought he'd be good. And I said, well, he doesn't have any military experience. This reporter, oh, no, Dick Cheney had us. No, no, he didn't, you know. So the reporter called, and I didn't know you could get the draft record. The Washington Post got it, and they found out that he had first graduate school. Okay, they took that away. Then married, they took that away. You know, <clears throat> uh, married with a child, okay? 13 weeks after Johnson took that, <clears throat> you know, married without children away, he went to the draft board with the pregnancy certificate. Okay, so he was actually, you know, beating the system. And a lot of people, and a lot of people, you know, a lot of people uh, did. So <clears throat> basically, you, the elites could get out or they could get into the guard. So, we, we didn't want to call him, but that's the second pillar. Third pillar has been mentioned here is uh, the fact that you're gonna use the private sector. Now originally we started always pretty good. Military people should, you know, KP, you know, you're cooking and all that kind of stuff, that made sense. Some of the, you know, <clears throat> the maintenance work and all that, because your soldiers, you know, basically you're training them to fight and this is what you want them to, you know, <clears throat> want them to uh, do. So. That makes sense. And then the fourth pillar was draft registration, okay? That was part of the AVS. It was kept by Nixon when he did it. Now, Ford took it away under prodding from one Donald Rumsfeld, and then Carter brought it back when the Soviets went into Afghanistan. Now, I got involved in trying to persuade President Reagan whether he should keep draft registration. Now, it's a very interesting thing because people forget that when Carter brought it back, the Congress said, okay, but you, Mr. President, have to put the money in the budget. If you don't, it goes away, okay? So here it is, 1981, and President Reagan has to make this decision. Uh, I had to write the paper. I was uh, over in the Pentagon and manpower and logistics, so it came to me to write the paper. And trying to be a good academic and a good servant, I gave the President the pros and cons of keeping it or not keeping it. Interesting enough, the night before the meeting, the Chief of Staff of the Army calls the Secretary of Defense complaining about the paper. Secretary of Defense calls me and he said, General Meyer's all upset about it. And uh, I said, yes, sir, have you read the paper? No, he hadn't read the paper, okay. Fine, we'll call the president. What were you upset about? He said, it's too balanced. Your job is to make sure the president keeps it. And I think, no, my job is to make sure the president knows the option. So anyway, we go to the meeting. One of the arguments I made was that, Mr. President, if you have a long war, you're gonna need to have conscription. Your army's too small to fight, okay? So we haven't done it. So what have we done, okay? And in my view, it's not only <clears throat> bad you know, policy, it's unethical. Because you tell people, when you volunteer, okay, for every year you spend in a combat zone, we'll give you two years at home, at least two. You tell the Guard and Reserve only one year out of every six. That's a promise. Now we don't write it down, and obviously if, you know, the war of necessity like World War II, we, we, we wouldn't do that, but that's the promise that you make. And so we haven't done that, so what have we done? More private contractors, okay, doing military work. When I was in Iraq in 2007, I was guarded by two former members of the South African military, okay? <laughs> And so we were driving around, and because we'd go one way, always go the wrong way around the circles, you know, and, and things. And these guys were armed with AK-47s. And I said, what are you gonna do if they don't get out of the way? We'll shoot them. 
Can you imagine you're driving and somebody goes the wrong way? You're going to panic, you know, or, or something like that. But that, you know, that's what we had turned, uh, you know, turned that over. Too many private uh, uh, contractors. And we have overused both the Guard and Reserve and the active force, okay? And to me, as Americans, I can't believe we do it. Now, you can say we shouldn't have gone to Afghanistan and Iraq. Our Congress voted for both of those things, okay? Only 23 members of the Senate voted against going to Iraq. Only 23, okay? The first Gulf War, 47 voted against, all right? You vote against it, you've got to have the courage of your convictions, and we haven't. And therefore, even, now the Army's doing okay now because of the economy being bad. But go back and take a look up through 2007, take it in felons and, and, uh, and, and the moral waivers that they, you know, that they were doing. Not only does it hurt the Army, but it's immoral, okay? What kind of people are we that we allow this to happen? And so when you think about it, remember, yes, we went to a volunteer military because the draft wasn't working and all that kind of stuff, but there is a fourth pillar there, okay? And if we don't do that with the fourth pillar, not these young men and women who don't completely represent all of us are made to suffer much more than they should. Thank you very much. Thank you, commentators, and thank you, Judith, for your, um, um, Beth, for your presentation. So now the floor is open for questions, comments. Anybody want to get drafted? <laughs> <laughs> Please identify yourself. Uh, wait one second, wait for the mic, okay. Thanks, thanks to all three of you. Um, Beth, you mentioned um, in, in passing that this has had an effect on women, obviously, that women are now mm -hmm. in the military. And I'm just wondering, could you talk briefly about what the effect has been on racial and ethnic minorities in the military and uh, what kind of percentage they have come up to? Are they, as far as you know, signing up for reasons that are similar to the reasons that other people sign up? Um, what, is, what is the genesis of their interest in the military other than the obvious economic one? And just can you talk about that a little bit? That's, that answer requires a, a lot of historical context because it changed dramatically over time. So initially in the 1970s, um, African American men were uh, enlisting at extraordinarily high rates, uh, which was prompting a lot of concern about the lack of representation. Um, on the one hand, the, uh, the argument made, and, and uh, Clifford Alexander, who was, who was Secretary of the Army under Carter, uh, m really emphasized the importance of allowing young African American men to enlist in the military and, and the Army. Um, but at the same time, military folks were saying the, the opposite side of opportunity is exploitation. And as we're looking at this and talking about having, you know, 40 percent African American enlistment, uh, if we have a war, that suddenly becomes highly disproportionate rates of casualties as well. And with the echoes of genocide and cannon fodder still echoing from Vietnam, this was a, a very highly charged discussion in the 1970s. Um, what happened in terms um, of racial and ethnic minorities over time is that African Americans remain uh, more highly represented, um, although the enlistment rates dropped dramatically starting in 2001. Um, African Americans are more likely to re-enlist than um, Caucasians and uh, African American women make up a very, very high percentage of all women in the Army. But, uh, and Latino representation is lower than proportionate, in part because there are lower rates of high school graduation. Uh, and the Army invested very seriously in trying to think how to handle the issues of ethnic and racial diversity and to ensure leadership and, um, and uh, equity uh, among the force and worked very hard. I mean, Army retired generals were some of those who signed on uh, for in, in favor of, of affirmative action and race-conscious policies when Michigan was considering 
um, with the Supreme Court, it's, it's admissions policies. And so, you know, all of these issues are things that a lot of people have thought very hard about, uh, not always successfully, but the issue of race and ethnicity has been absolutely central to decisions about recruiting and the shape of the force all the way through. And um, many people today will point to the military and say this is one of our great success stories. I mean, you know, Charlie Muskos and John Butler, uh, you know, that was one of their major arguments in terms of the military is that for African Americans, the military, the Army in particular, is an enormous path to success. Yeah, let me make a comment because I think it's, it's a critical question. <clears throat> when I was in office, I was visited one day by the Reverend Jesse Jackson to talk about this particular subject. <clears throat> And the point I made to him was, well, when the rest of society offers as many opportunities to African Americans, we won't get them. It's not just enlistment, it's reenlistment. I said, would you have us put a quota on reenlistment? And I think the reason for that is because, however imperfect, you know, nothing is perfect. The military's pretty good about it. I mean, they fought Truman like the blazes when he, you know, decided to integrate. And in fact, the Navy really doesn't integrate till the 70s, okay? But once they did it, you know, then they'll, they'll do it well. One of the things that concerned me, and I think we were able to, you know, to deal with it, it was not just the percentage that were there, but they were all in the combat arms. And so if you, the higher percentage, and so therefore if you had, you know, a war, they would get the casualties. So we made a conscious effort to make sure that when anybody showed up, you recognize the Army is more than the infantry. You know, we have all of these other, you know, specialties and you need to think about them. But, you know, what happens a lot is your lowest socioeconomic educational background, the, the, you know, they, they put you in the infantry rather than one of these technical. So we made a positive effort to do that. Now, the other thing that's fascinating, and Beth just mentioned it, the African-American people in this country did not support particularly the war in Iraq. And even with these high, you know, bonuses and everything Judith was talking about, the percentage of African Americans enlisting dropped dramatically, uh, you know, as we got into, uh, into Iraq. So it was more than just the, you know, the economic, uh, you know, concerns. It's also important that all of this over-representation is really Army, not the other services, and is also enlisted and not the officers. Mm -hmm. So this over-representation and I think that African Americans have cleverly gotten an emphasis on logistics and some of the other areas so that we have not had overrepresentation in casualties. Um, yeah. Please identify yourself. Yeah, I'm Avner <coughs> Cohen, I'm public policy scholar here. Uh, just uh, two questions of curiosity. I did not have a chance yet to, to, to look seriously at your book. How much of your research was? Uh, historical, that is to say, by looking at documents and interviewing people, and how much of it, if, it, if any, was anthropological, that is to say, actually going to, to, to places, joining units, and having a sense of how they live and how they do things, and, and you know, that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And related question is, how much do you deal with, which in my view is a very important aspect of understanding the Army, the question of ethos? That is to say, the identity of, 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 the, of the organization as and the difference between that organization and Navy, Marine, Air Force, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a historian, so my research was historical and nothing anthropological, um, in part because I can't recapture what it felt like in the 1970s by going to uh, an Army post today. Um, I read a lot of analyses that were done at the time by people who were trying to do the anthropological analysis. So it's, it wasn't firsthand, but it was the ways in which experts at that moment did try to make sense of, of the ethos of how it felt on, to, to join the Army. Um, and, and I think that's actually more useful than trying to reconstruct it. I mean, interviews are wonderful. It's a great way to get a feel for things. It's a great way to find connections you'd otherwise miss. But people do tend to uh, re-envision what happened according to the ways in which they've developed their own understandings over time. So I relied whenever possible on the historical records that were generated at the time. Um, and in terms of ethos, uh, I wasn't trying to explain what, what ethos exists so much as the ways in which the Army tried to craft a certain kind of ethos. So in watching uh, the sets of uh, conversations that were about de trying to determine what a warrior ethos is and how to inculcate it in soldiers, 
you know, I, I was trying to analyze that, not trying to, you know, go among soldiers and see whether or not they embody a warrior ethos. I mean, most of the conversations I've had with um, men and women in the Army lately, uh, they're, they're slightly bewildered by the emphasis on the warrior ethos and, and how it's so omnipresent and are curious about where it came from, which is one of the things that I do explain in, in the book. And I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that the book could be actually interesting to people who are in the military today, because the things that people live with, uh, sometimes I can explain their origins and the debates that's, that created them when they're just sort of bewildered about why they're so omnipresent and don't necessarily make a whole lot of sense to their lived experiences. Uh, one of the things that you haven't talked about is this whole marketing and hiring the ad agencies and what the ad agencies put forward and argued. And then the ad agencies having a very clear view of what might happen based upon the way young people thought. And then somebody over in Congress says, no, we're not going to say that. <laughs> yeah. So the interference by the House Armed Services Committee uh, was, was a really relevant thing. I mean, the military might be doing something, and then all of a sudden they get their legs cut off at the knees. Yeah, w watching the relationship between Congress and the military is fascinating. And congressional uh, hearings are one of the best possible sources for historians, in part because it's amazing what <laughs> representatives will simply say for the record, uh, especially back in the 1970s. But uh, a lot of the book is about marketing and advertising, and the campaigns are, are truly fascinating. I, I resisted the impulse to bring in a PowerPoint slide and show you all the ads and, and play the New Army Strong commercial. But uh, uh, most particularly the ones aimed at women, um, where <laughs> through the 1970s they're advertising, join the Army and find a husband. Um, and sort of realize that what they want to do is, is find women who want to fix trucks and guaranteeing them that they can maintain their femininity and date is probably not the best way to find women who want to fix trucks. Um, so, so watching the ways in which this very sophisticated market advertising works and then the hiring of, uh, you know, the, the most recent ad was done by the, um, the choreographers and videographers who did the Nike commercials and you can tell. Uh, they're, they're very high budget, very sophisticated ads, and people constantly are telling me they heard the music and it made, me, made them think of joining the military, um, you know, even though they're 75 and probably wouldn't <laughs> accept it. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. It's not just Congress. You know, you get people in the executive branch. I, the Monday after the Super Bowl, every year I was there, two things would happen. Number one, the Secretary of Defense would say to me, how much are we paying for those ads? <laughs> And number two, why don't we just have one? Why do each of the services have to have their own? And I would say, well, look, sir, people don't join the Department of Defense. It's <laughs> Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. Well, I don't care. We ought to have one ad. So I would say, okay, we'll do a study on it. And he'd forget about it next year. We, you know, we do, do that every, every year. And the same way with Congress. You'd have people second-guessing. I remember, you know, coming in and in my view, the person who saved the all-volunteer uh, army was uh, Max Thurman, General Thurman. And he understood, you know, he must have, even though he was a soldier, he had an intuitive sense of, you know, the, the right marketing. But I can remember going up to, uh, you know, to be the market guys in New York and all that, you know, kind of kind of talk to them. And I would say, well, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but it seems to me if you say today's army wants to join you, you're going to get the wrong people. Whereas if you say, be all you can be, we're a, con you know, we're a country, you know, not a company, and things like that, that that would be, you know, uh, you know uh, better. But it's interesting to look at the, the ads and, and, and things like that. My own personal view is that you were asking the Army to do something they were not prepared to because manpower was basically a free good, you know, up until that. Now you say, okay, go compete in the marketplace. Well, these soldiers, okay, and, you know, and, 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 and can you imagine if uh, your native country decided that they wanted to go, you know, how they, you know, what they, they would do it? I mean, because you have, uh, you know, people have to serve. You don't have to worry about that, you know, how you pitch it. But it is a very, very, you know, it's a fascinating thing because you're asking them military. And I think if you go back, you know, I mean, that was part of the problem. It was easy for Nixon to say, let's send the draft, okay. You know, and we're going to end it on such and such a date, but, you know, all of these other things, you know, have to be there. And, and the military didn't like it. Um, Westmoreland used to call them mercenaries, okay? And Milton Friedman, when they had the debate about it, would say, well, do you want them to be slaves, you know? And that was a type of thing. And the Congress did not like 
the volunteer military of the Eastern Initiative. People like Sam Nunn and stuff like that really resented it. And in fact, what Nunn tried to do was put limitations that he thought we couldn't meet so that you could end it. In other words, a percentage of high school graduates and, and, and you know, category fours and all that kind of stuff. Oh, she asked a question about the women, and we haven't talked about that at all. Oh, I thought she said no. She started it out. Yeah. That, that it, it's something well, very. Well, I mean, the interesting about. thing is that in the Gates Commission study, they didn't have any particular feeling that they needed would have to recruit more women, and up until 1967 or 68, by law, you could not have more than two percent. Although we actually had about one percent, and they could only rise to a certain level. But they, in fact, in the early days, are really the salvation of the all-volunteer force, and they just increased dramatically up to 1980 when Reagan said, we're having a woman pause, by which he didn't mean they wouldn't keep recruiting, but they wouldn't keep increasing the percentage. And then they, they needed them, and we're now about 14% overall, and that's held pretty steady. Now, let me get to the women thing, because you hit me pretty hard in the book about that. You took a quotation of mine out of context, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, the context it was in. It's nice in to have living source. history. <laughs> but what I, I think what happened is, no, the military thought that when Reagan came in because he was against the ERA and Phyllis Schlafly mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, that they could not have to meet the quotas that Carter had given them, okay? Which were ever increasing. Yeah, and, and, and basically part of the reason that Carter administration did it was because if you don't go to half the population, you're going to have trouble, you know, meeting, your, meet, meeting your, your, your quotas. And so what they did was, okay, and so basically I had to spend, you know, like a year and a half having to deal with that. And then the Army, without, I wasn't even sworn in yet when they went and, you know, mentioned that before the Congress and the Air Force did it, the, all the members. So basically, when the Army did its study, I said, I don't care how it comes out, but you better have more women than when you went in. And they did. And the thing, card I was able to play was that even though Reagan might have been influenced with Phyllis Schlafly and, you know, that crowd, my boss Weinberger had put Title IX in. And I got him to send out a, a message. Now, the interesting thing about, the, and this is the great thing about the military, they fight everything. They didn't want African Americans, they didn't want women, you know, they didn't want to end the draft and all that. In 2000, I think it was uh, five, 2005, Elaine Donnelly, who runs this Center on Military Readiness, gets to Duncan Hunter, who's the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, and says, the Army is using women inappropriately uh, in Iraq, okay? They're violating the forms, you know, it's supposed to be in direct combat and all that kind of stuff. So she put, so they put this amendment in. You know what the Army says? Get it out. We don't want that. We'd lose the war. You know, I mean, it's an interesting thing. And so the Navy just announced under no pressure that I could see, they're going to put women on submarines. All of a sudden, they just, well, it announced. So in other words, they've recognized that while they might fight to it, then, then they become, they really, you know, push ahead with, the, with, the, with these things. And so, therefore, the issue now is going to dominate is the whole question of, you know, uh, gays in the military. That's going to be the next issue that's going to come up. And Barney Frank said he's going to put an amendment on the 2011 defense bill, so it could be interesting to see what happens. So maybe you can write another chapter here when the <laughs> Well, it's interesting, too, because the arguments about gays in the military now, it, the, the argument against was always about u unit morale, and now the argument for is about unit morale. And so mm -hmm. it's just flipped the same argument on its yeah. head. Do you have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, you people are the experts, and I... Well, we're being set up. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> Please identify yourself. <laughs> so I have uh, one impression and... Uh, one thought. My real impression is either system can be made to work. There's no reason why not. And we can have an effective military under the volunteer system or under recruitment if we do it right. You can have this little percentage, that little percentage by the end of the day. The decisions are made politically. And the first volunteer army eliminated the opposition to Vietnam. And it was largely made politically. There were people who believed in it. That's a separate matter. But politically, it stopped the opposition to Vietnam. That 
is the political history of how things are sometimes made in our country. Now, I may be overstating it, and I'll be happy to hear the experts level me. Political science, we call it a concurrent decision, which means people for very, very different and even opposing reasons concur on the policy. And so my position would be, yes, you're right, but also the libertarians were right. <laughs> and, and that it's a really marvelous example of a concurrent policy, where, where you have almost antithetical views converging on the policy. I think if you go back and you look at it historically, even before Vietnam got heated up, you had a congressman from uh, Illinois by the name of Donald Rumsfeld that was pushing for the, for, the, for the AVF and joined by people like Melvin Laird and things like that who became Secretary of Defense. So they did believe in it philosophically. That was before you know, it, it heated up. Uh, now, I would say where your point is very relevant now is just as Nixon probably wanted to end it maybe you know, for the wrong reason or to defuse opposition to Vietnam, the reason you haven't you know, gone to all those people who registered now is because if you did, people would want you to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan. In other words, I think had President Bush, when we decided to go to, <clears throat> to Iraq, came out and announced, look, we have already in Afghanistan. This is a war. I think this is critical for all of the reasons you know, that it's going to give. And so therefore, to ensure that we do it right, I am going to activate the selective services, whatever, you know, get the lottery, you know, get your numbers out and we're going to you know, do that. I think people would have said, wait a second here. I mean, and I think mm -hmm. that was the reason that, that's the reason they haven't done what I call the fourth pillar now. I mean, because they don't want that. And I think, you know, you know, we, in the comments that Beth and Judith make, people don't have a stake right now. And so therefore, well, you want to, it's kind of an academic exercise. Well, should we send more troops to Afghanistan or not? You know, and nobody's saying, where are you going to get them? Are you going to, not keep these people home lo long, you know, long enough, or you know, what's it you're going to be? I mean, people worry about the cost, but not the the personal cost of it. But on, on the question of Iraq, which you would know far better than me, there has not been a drop. A few years ago, when Iraq was at its height, not a drop in volunteers. Oh, there. Th that's when the army was given eight thousand moral waivers to get people in. They promoting people who were still alive. I mean, if that could, if somebody said, you know, you have to have a felony conviction to keep from getting promoted. I mean, and we're going to be paying for that because you selected a lot of people for higher ranks, both officers and non-commissioned officers who are going to be there. And 10 years from now, we turn around and say, how did that man or woman ever get promoted to this job? And you'll go back because you, you know, had this pyramid and it's basically almost been like that. Beth, do you want to give us some historical perspective on, on these issues? I mean, I thought you made a different argument in the book about the reasons for the moving to the draft, that it wasn't necessarily to defuse the opposition to Vietnam. Well, by the time um, the draft was ended, the last person uh, went into the military for his term of conscripted service on uh, you know, June 30th, 1973, by which time U.S. ground troops weren't in Vietnam anymore. Um, but you know, I, I agree with what Judith said. It, there were concurrent forces. People, for very diametrically opposite reasons, were supporting the move away. But my point is that once it happens, it did force it into the market. And uh, pe the, the military had to contend with those market forces. And the, the people who were thinking about it as primarily moved to the market had a lot of influence in shaping what happened, even though the widespread opposition to the draft for a whole number of reasons, including opposition to the war in Vietnam, um, made it possible to make that move politically. So it, you know, it, it wasn't a single force at all that, that made this happen. And the, yeah, go ahead, please. And please identify yourself. Yep. Shannon Cruz, a public policy scholar here, and I guess truth in advertising, also an Air Force colonel, uh, the, only, <laughs> the only one here. I, I'm sorry I step in late, but it, you're somewhat, I'm, your, your shock or amazement with the transition of the military's thought on things, it doesn't seem you know, to be all that congruent with the fact that after 20 years, we're almost entirely an entirely different force. We're almost all mm -hmm. gone. You know, I, I got in the military in 1990, which means I'm a post-Cold War, you know, colonel, for gosh sakes. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. these things do change, and, and you give it 20 years. Uh, we change with our society, not, 
how much different than the society changes. And, I, and so I do expect to find a completely different argument over gays in the military, but you know, obviously mm -hmm. I'm off the record on that, <laughs> since I'm just uh, commenting a personal opinion on that. But I guess another side, and the question I have, you know, with the volunteer force, a, a concern that I very much do have is the self-selection of, of who comes in, and also as each of us do affect the military, and predominantly it's the loss of ROTC at a lot of your uh, Princeton's, uh, all of your Ivy League. No, students. Princeton still has it. Or Princeton. Careful. Oh, ah, yeah. you're right. Sorry, sorry there. Try Harvard. Uh, Harvard. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, we are not getting a. It would be very important to get those attitudes into the military to affect it in a positive way from those attitudes to exclude uh, large parts of the population by the volunteer force. It makes us, and we're becoming, you know, in some ways more and more politicized. You know, th and these are scary things uh, to be in the military, and, and I guess I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, that, that's one of my concerns in writing this book, is thinking about the ways in which the military draws from a narrower portion of the American public. Uh, people who come from military families are much more likely to join. Uh, it, you know, there, there's amazing levels of research done about propensity to join in order to most effectively target those people who are likely to join. There's, you know, no point given it costs $22,000 to recruit each new soldier. Um, it's less expensive for the other services. And thus they want to make sure that in aggregate they can best predict who will be likely to join and who will be likely to succeed. And that means a further narrowing of targeting, not only the fact that people are already self-selecting. And that's a problem. Um, I think it's a problem for exactly the reasons you raise. Um, I think it's a problem because it means that the military is drawing in fewer people with divergent understandings. I think it's also a problem because a lot of people who are in positions of authority or positions to either embrace or uh, attack the notion of going to war are less invested in, in the problem because they can stand wholly separate to it. So it's both an internal and an external um, issue that we need to deal with as a nation. Um, it's not that I have a, a solution to that, but I, I do think that it's something we need to pay more attention to. I think one of the things you have to be careful of, and it's interesting since you're in the Air Force, I was up at Boston College last weekend for a symposium on the military and society, and there was a young man there, former naval officer, who had worked in the White House when I was there, and he was concerned about the number of evangelical Christians particularly in the Air Force and that impact, you know, on, you know, how they think about their leaders and thing, things like that. And so there are dangers, uh, you know, to it. But I'd also say that if you go back and you take a look, during the war in Vietnam, you weren't getting it from Columbia and Harvard anyway, you know. So, I mean, I think you have to, you know, keep, keep that in mind. I think, you know, somebody, you know, the number of, of people who, from Harvard who died in Vietnam and listed people. I remember Charlie Moscow talking about a very, very small number, you know, Six. of, uh, <laughs> you know, people who, who, who died. So I think that's where we were. And now I've read this, and I'm not a historian, but I swear I read it. Back in World War I, one of the reasons we went to a draft is so it wouldn't be all fought by the elites, because they thought this was a great thing, you know, prove their manhood and all this kind of stuff. And everybody said, no, we better have a draft to make sure we get the rest of the country here, rather than just having sort of the elites fighting this war. Very medieval. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just sort of to pick up on that um, point about the draft, um, I mean, it seems to, that the, the reason, one of the reasons, one of the main sources of opposition to the war in Vietnam was because of the draft. So your argument about, your concern about um, excluding dissident voices from the military by having an all-volunteer force, um, I mean, is that, I'm trying to, I, I have this clear in my head now, I'm mixing it up, but anyway, but I mean, does that mean that, that, so does that put all the dissident, does that, do you think that, that, that tamps down dissidents because people don't have a stake in it? Or are you saying that people, the people who are not in the military now, um, you know, are more likely to actually become, be, be opposed to it because they don't really understand it from within? In other yeah. words, does having an all voluntary force, all, all volunteer force, uh, defuse the possibility of opposition or is it, does it, it just shift? I think having an all-volunteer force makes it possible for a large percentage of Americans not to have to think very hard about it one way or another. 
And I think that in terms of within the military, it's not that people are excluded, it's that uh, there's a fair amount of self-selection and, and it becomes a, a narrower cohort of people who think about joining. Um, and in part because for, for reasons of efficiency, the Army targets those people they think are most likely to volunteer in order not to be just sort of broadcasting on, on the Super Bowl very expensive commercials <laughs> that, you know, most people aren't going to think about listening. I should also say that in terms of, of the advertising, um, anybody who watches one of these ads and goes out to the recruiting station probably won't get accepted to the Army. Um, it, you know, it, it, they're, they're, they're powerful, but it's, it's meant to be the, the, the small cell. It's meant to get you to contract a recruiter or go online and look for more information. It's not really meant for you to see the ad and march in and sign on the dotted line. Um, but but that, that question of whether or not uh, a, a draft, I mean, you know, a, as um, Larry is pointing out, the, the notion that the draft somehow magically encompassed the entire population and was universal is completely false. So that's one of the reasons I'm saying that the draft won't immediately solve everything. But the notion of registration, the notion that one might be called to service, that one might have to confront these issues would make it much more likely that young men and women and their families have to pay attention to whether or not they support or oppose current military actions and probably would create more dissent. Uh, oh. <laughs> Please identify yourself. Yes, my, uh, my name is Karen Wilhelm and I'm retired and currently a uh, doctoral candidate at Georgetown. Uh, rather lurid headlines last week about 75% of yeah. American youth <laughs> not qualified to enlist, which kind of struck me as unfortunate but not really significant since we don't need more than 25% to enlist. I would like to hear your take on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I got quoted in that story. Um, you did? Yes. Sure. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's, it's more alarming. It's more alarming for the nation as a whole that seven out of ten young people wouldn't qualify to enlist because it says something about the levels of education that people are attaining and the physical fitness that people have achieved. And so, while we certainly don't need, I mean, we, we probably do need a, a larger army than we have right now, but but. If seven out of ten young people couldn't qualify to serve in the nation's military, that, that should raise alarms. And my sense of, of the way in which this was handled is that it was calling upon the notion of national security as a way to raise attention for a larger problem that we face in American society. Not that this is an immediate crisis for the military because seven out of ten couldn't qualify. But hasn't that often been the case? I mean, that was the reason we got public health after World War I. It's the reason we've gotten advances in medicine. I mean, the military uh, needs often are stimuli for other, you know, kinds of advances. They are, and, 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 and can be used as arguments for other kinds of advances. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, know, you ever drive around the interstate highway system? That was a uh, right. national defense highway. Remember after Sputnik had the National Defense Education Act? Yeah, I mean, it's very, very good. When I was uh, in government, I had to go down and address the Florida legislature to get them to spend more money on education because we said it was a national security issue. So, yeah, I mean, even people who don't like government, you know, uh, basically would say, well, for national security, you know, we'll do it. So. Mm -hmm. I think this would be, you know, a way to, to, to deal with that. I mean, one of the things is, uh, you know, a lot of people assume that the military is an employer of last resort in terms of the enlisted ranks, and, you know, the Army very definitely doesn't see it that way and doesn't want it to be that way. Um, but if, if the goal is to have more than 90 percent of high school graduates, when in the average in the country, 70 percent or fewer young people graduate from high school, and now about 60 percent of young people who graduate from high school go to college within a year. It doesn't mean they graduate, but they try. Um, we're, we're narrowing down that cohort of people th that can be addressed. There are a lot of conversations about whether or not the military should be trying to target for enlisted, um, for the enlisted ranks, people who've already graduated from college, um, you know, to, to, to widen the pool. But as there is a shift to the notion that we may need less physical capabilities in order to serve, um, there's, there's a notion that we need more intellectual capabilities and uh, the, the number of people who are available is smaller than it used to be, especially given if it's a choice, a lot of people are going to not choose to join the Army. 
we actually enlisted illiterate people in World War I and some in World War II. So in, in one sense, our quality standards have been going up and up and up. Our quality standards have gone up enormously despite real problems over the last few years with the moral waivers. Uh, the percentage of people who had graduated had an earned high school degree got down to 83 percent, which was quite low. Um, right now it's about 95 percent, which is way above uh, the criteria for the country in general in terms of high school graduation. Um, that has to do with the economy and it has to do with the drop in casualty figures from Iraq. Uh, Afghanistan hasn't registered yet for, for the previous year's enlistment and we'll see what happens. But, uh, but it's only 65,000 non-prior service enlistees and so, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a, a quite a small piece of the American youth population right now. And I think it's important to keep in mind the reasons <coughs> that you have these standards. I mean, it's very expensive to get a man or woman, very expensive to train them. The last thing you want is them to flunk out, not complete the enlistment, cause you problems. So the data shows that the higher education and the higher, you know, the standards are, the better they're going to perform, the more easily they'll be trained. So, I mean, that's the reason for it. It's not that we, people are saying, oh, well, you know, let's just take anybody who shows up or something like that. I mean, and that's what happens when you get a volunteer military, because by the time that person walks in the door, you got 20 grand invested in them. So you want to make sure that, uh, you know, that they're going to do the job. Now, some of you are almost as old as me here will understand this. Max Thurman used to always say, the Army is not Joe and Willie and the Doughboys anymore, which is back to the, you know, the World War, you know, one or two thing. It's a pretty sophisticated operation. You need to be able to master a lot of skills. But nevertheless, a very high percentage of people don't finish basic training and another very high percentage don't complete whatever their contract was. And I think you have the statistics in your book. I don't think civilians have any idea. They think that once, you're, mm -hmm. once you've sworn, you're going to fulfill your contract. And it's, what is it, a third that don't fulfill their contract? Mm -hmm. So even, even now with this high quality army, a third of them don't make it through to their contract. Uh, five out of six African American men complete their term of enlistment successfully, and I think it's, two out of three white men. Um, so, you know, th those are the current or recent statistics. So isn't that an argument more, I mean, given the investment and the need for hi highly technical training and so forth, isn't that an argument in favor of an all-volunteer army? I mean, how do you, how do you achieve those same um, rates of effectiveness in a, in a draft army? Well, when, with the move away from the draft, one of the concerns was that the military was going to lose in the enlisted ranks the people who scored at the top, <coughs> and that definitely dropped. But they also lost a lot of the people who came in at the bottom and, uh, you know, found that to be much more satisfactory in terms of being able to train and also in terms of, of people getting along with one another. A lot of the tensions in the 1970s, racial violence and tensions, certainly had to do with what was going on in the larger society, but it also had to do with a lot of people, um, black and white, coming from poor, poorly educated backgrounds, and uh, that created an awful lot of tension and once they were able to draw people who were better educated and who scored more highly on the admissions exams, they also were able to enforce people getting along in new ways. And, and an all-volunteer force is a more effective military because people enlist for longer times. You have a draft, you two years, and now you can get people for four years. You can invest a lot of money in training. And then you do say, for example, if you look how we're uh, deploying people in this war compared to Vietnam. Vietnam, the unit was over, you kept replacing the soldiers. Now you deploy the whole unit so these people are trained together and so they can be a more effective fighting force. I know, I don't think anybody's arguing go back to the draft. My point is when you have a long war rather than, you know, doing the things you're doing to the volunteers, then you activate the selective service system to fill in the blanks until you can, you know, until you finish that. One thing I haven't mentioned, I mean, the other thing that's come up is stop loss. You volunteer, and then we can keep you longer. <laughs> well, wait a second, you know, that is that is a draft, see? Backdoor draft. Yeah. I, I think it's also important we talk about the effectiveness and it is important at the same time always to think about equity because if it's too inequitable, it's also not going to be effective. And so I think it's really important that any analysis include both of those components. 
Has there, um, Beth, did you in your research come across debate about using incentives like education and things like that as, a, as an incentive? A lot, and uh, probably the, the stranger story, uh, I was interviewing uh, An Alan Ono, who was the head of the recruiting command in the 1980s, mid-1980s after um, Max Thurman, he was one of his protégés uh, in Hawaii and where he's retired, where he'd grown up. And he said that the move in the mid-1980s to emphasizing college and all Army advertising was in part because it was a useful benefit to draw the kind of people that uh, the Army very much wanted. But market research had shown that parents thought that if your child went to college, he or she was a success, whereas if they joined the Army, um, that was a failure. And so they decided that if they could associate the Army with college, whether or not people took advantage of the opportunities or not, that would be an enormous impact in terms of enlisting the right kind of people and having parents support tr young people's notions of joining the Army. So in many ways, uh, it, it was a real benefit that people had, and it changed a lot of people's lives. But it also was a marketing decision to make the Army appear to be success rather than failure. Um, you know, so that was one of the places where an interview really made a difference. Uh, nobody put that in writing. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a question down there? Yeah, please. Question yeah. right oh, I'm here. sorry, I didn't see it. Yes, hello. My name is Robert Henschman, and uh, the Air Force is so roughly well represented. I'm an Army Colonel. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, active duty, yes. And uh, thank you very much for your panel today. Um, we pointed out earlier that the Army has gotten smaller over the past couple of decades. Um, Dr. Korb, you just pointed out that uh, the, the stop loss can and has been viewed pretty negatively in our society as a de facto draft. Now, keeping in mind that we always want to use our resources as they're available, and you pointed out that, that having a draft is a fourth pillar, um, and looking to the future, as we wrap up in Iraq, and one day when we finish in <coughs> Afghanistan, we know that, that we have huge national deficits, and we know that there is always pressure to use the military as a bill payer. What happens 5, 10, 15 years down the road if we further shrink the military after these wars, which after every big war we have cut the military. Is the all-volunteer force, it, in, in your research, did you find that the all-volunteer force is becoming part of the American cultural psyche to the point where if we tried to actually levy a draft in the event of a new national emergency, we might have significant trouble doing that? That's a very good question. I mean, I, I suppose the question is what the national emergency is whether or not it really does appear to be a war of necessity or whether or not it appears to be a war of choice. Uh, and, um, you, you know, I think that I would say that we learned a lot of lessons about how important it is to maintain a, you know, significantly sized military from this. And we learned a lot of lessons about the ways in which we need to be training and preparing people in the reserves for potential service. The, you know, one weekend a month adds. Uh, really did a disservice to a lot of people, even though obviously if they joined they knew that they could conceivably be called and deployed. Uh, it, it, it's not a good way to approach the notion of, of reserve duty. Um, so it, it's very hard to say. I, I think that in terms of public reaction, it would make people react. It would make people try and figure out what where they stood on that action and become more involved in those decisions as citizens. Um, I, I wouldn't predict that it's become such a normal thing that people would immediately reject. I mean, you know, we have, before 1940, it was always volunteer force except for during times of war when the draft was implemented and conscription was met often with riots and an enormous amount of resistance at those points. So. You know, it's, it's not just an, an even trajectory here, but by 1973, the draft had come to seem just a normal part of American life to a generation of fathers and their sons. And so the move to a volunteer force, there was an awful lot of opposition to the draft during the Vietnam War. And so I think it, it depends an awful lot about the specific con you know, construct of what happens at that moment. I don't think you're going to have to worry about the decline of the military. I mean, when the Cold War ended, everybody predicted that the military went down. I mean, the Army suffered, you know, the most because, not because they were against the Army, it was the whole transformation and the revolution and military affair. You remember all of that type of, uh, you know, type of thing that uh, that was going to, you were going to substitute technology 
for manpower, and then the Army was trying to figure out what do you do now that the Cold War's over and you don't have the, you know, the big Soviet things, and I don't have to tell you about the future combat system and all that that started even before, you know, you went into Iraq and, and, and Afghanistan. Interestingly enough, the Army's going to be fine. It's the Air Force is going to have the problems because people are saying, okay, we're buying into counterinsurgency, manpower intensive. What does the Air Force do? You know, we're going to have unmanned planes, you know, and, 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 and it's a very interesting thing because the Air Force for so long was kind of the golden service. They, you know, did very well in the budget and, 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 and things like that. Now the Air Force is trying to figure out what do they do? Are they just going to fly the Army around, you see, or, you know, and, and it, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, subject. And Rand has done some interesting studies, you know, on, you know, kind of where does the Air Force, uh, you know, go and, 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 you know, what's their future in this you know, what Bush used to call the war on terror, I guess we don't call it that anymore, whatever, you know, we call it because it looks like the, the Army's going to, the Army's going to do fine. I mean, the Army's going to be bigger than it was before September 11th, and uh, I think you might lose the 22,000 extra that Gates gave this year, but I think you'll still be 550,000 or so, uh, you know, active Army when this is over. Yes. I'm Lincoln Bramwell. I'm a historian actually with the Forest Service here in Washington, D.C. And I have a question for the panel about, and we've been alluding to this a little bit, about how there weren't conscriptions uh, during times of peace prior to uh, uh, the outbreak of many wars. Do, do you see a change in sort of the, the political discussion with um, in the last 20 years when this all-volunteer force has been so inculcated in, in the society in a run-up? In terms of, it seems like in today's, and this is just a, a personal impression, it seems like such a small amount of the, the country is involved in the military that uh, there seems to be a little discussion about the burden of a war uh, on the American people. And I was just wondering if uh, this may be outside the bounds of, of your book a little bit, but if you notice uh, historically this you know, somewhat of a change to this all volunteer army that we've become accustomed to for the last 30, 40 years. I think there's a lot of discussion about the burden on the military, um, but there's not, that doesn't necessarily mean very much. I mean, we talk about the burden on the military, but that doesn't translate into burden being shared. Uh, there's, there's a lot of gratitude. I mean, one of the differences is in Vietnam, uh, you know, military was often attacked for policies that were, you know, not of, of their making. And in, in the, you know, current environment, the military is honored and uh, thanked, but not necessarily, uh, you know, the burden is acknowledged, but it doesn't change anything. So, you know, I, I see that as part of the, uh, you know, fallout from moving to a volunteer force. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, the AVF, in my view, makes it easier to go to war <coughs> because the American people say, okay, fine, the, you know, what, what, what do we have to worry about? Even if you had a draft, even with a comparatively small military, people would have to worry, it could be me, or it could be somebody I love, you know? Because it's a little bit off the subject. If you went back to a draft now, would you draft women? Okay, since they're 14 to 15 percent of the military, how do you, you know, how do you handle, uh, you know, that? I mean, so going back to a draft does raise a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, interesting, interesting question. But I do think that, and you see it, I mean, okay, Afghanistan was supported and Iraq was at least initially. I still believe that if, in fact, you know, we had conscription and the president said, I'm going to go to Iraq, I got to keep all these troops in Afghanistan, so therefore I'm going to have to, you know, do this, that occupation takes a long time. People would ask a lot more questions. Maybe more senators and congressmen would have read the whole NIE. I mean, to me, every one of those people who didn't read it, they should have been impeached or whatever you can do to people who don't do their jobs. I mean, how can you send people to war if you don't read the whole thing? Well, my staff read it. No, no, no. You have to read it. Um, I, just a second, Harvey. I, I just wonder if you, well, all of you, but maybe especially Judith, have a, uh, a thoughts about Lawrence's comment that um, if we had a draft now, we'd have to think about drafting women. What do you think? Of course women will get drafted. In 1940, before we were at war, a Gallup poll showed that the American public thought women should be drafted before married men. So the drafting women. How about married women, though? 
<laughs> well, I mean, one of the important things about the draft, <laughs> one of the important pieces of opposition to the draft was how inequitable it was. And then we sort of went to a lottery system. And so one of the way, you know, whether it will be accepted or not, a lot of it will have to do with what people think it's really, really fair or not. But yes, women will be drafted, at least those in certain specialties. So for instance, we need doctors. Women are more than half of the young doctors. So that it may not be that women will be drafted across the board because you may not need such large percentages, but there may be certain special drafts where the women will be drafted. But I just had one other point, which is, doesn't it shock anybody that we talk about wars of choice? I mean, what kind of a country goes to war just because it chooses to go to war? Hmm? I just want, did you want to comment on the women drafting women? I think that's one of the uh, reasons that nobody wants to touch it politically because, uh, you know, we would need to, I mean, it only makes sense to draft women, but it would create an enormous political firestorm that most people who would be on the front lines of this don't want to have to face. Uh, it's, it's, you know, that's, that's what happened last time. I mean, when Carter reinstated registration for the draft, he sent two bills to Congress. He sent one that provided for registering both men and women, and he sent one that provided only for men, which was his second choice. Um, you know, the, there was an enormous political shift in the country during the 1970s from um, both Democrats and Republicans wholeheartedly supporting the ERA in the early 1970s to a massive backlash against women's participation. And that started showing up in terms of decisions being made about military too. And, you know, Phyllis Schlafly said that this talk about drafting women is what put the nail in the coffin of the ERA. Um, you know, the world has changed enormously. Military, internal military understandings have changed enormously. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of people out there who would create an enormous amount of havoc, and that makes it very difficult to start talking about yeah. women in the draft. I almost got fired uh, because <clears throat> we were doing mobilization. It's hard to believe, you know, we're going to night have to fight the Soviet Union, worried about casualties and stuff. So our mobilization people did a thing that we would have to draft women doctors and nurses. Well, of course, somebody leaked that thing, and the headline in the Post said, Reagan wants to draft women. <laughs> oh, man, I mean, <laughs> and, you know, basically, if you're going to have, I mean, if we had fought World War II, I mean, you fought the Soviet Union, the casualties would have been immense, and you would have had to do that. So, yeah, it did create quite a, quite a firestorm. Uh, Harvey. Hi, my name is Harvey Wischakoff. I would say first on the women's issue, jurisprudentially you have an interesting phenomenon because the court has made it very clear about its understanding now of the mm -hmm. equal rights jurisprudence. So if you start making arguments that women are somehow different in the national security context, there are a number of other issues that flow from the court's perspective that I don't think people who believe in women's rights would particularly enthusiastic about. So I think you have to be very careful for why you think what the analytical arguments are for why women should not be drafted. And B, there are many other countries experiences that are drafting women. So if you look at Israel, women are a major part of it. Or if you look at it in a comparative perspective, it skews you a bit in terms of the view. Mm -hmm. My question, though, is um, when you, I, I pause in coming late, but I know um, Mary's work pretty well, and it's a four pillar argument. A lot turns on the concept of having a, a small force. And then your comment, Judith, about, oh, what kind of country is choosing to go to war? Well, I'd like you to address the concept of the doctrine that we've had has evolved over time. We used to call it the one four, one two. If you defend the homeland, you could be boarded in theater simultaneously. Two would be Navy theater. If you return, we'll take care of that theater and move forward. Well, that doctrine as a concept is sort of been under a great deal of, I would say, refinement over the last 50 years. <laughs> so the idea of wars being short are a little bit unclear. But more significantly, um, if you look on the horizon, we have a real problem of failing states. And we have a real problem of genocide. So for me, Judith, those are wars of choice. A decision to enter to stop a genocide in Africa is a war of choice. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a real moral issue. Second of and all, it's clear that it. Europe is becoming much less having the ability to go from moral reasons for not fighting to actually not having the ability to deploy forces. I'd say right now that the, the, the general consensus is NATO's capacity to deploy people, feed them and water them and tent them and get them independently somewhere around 25,000 troops. That's it. 
So now we have become the last country of resort vis-a-vis -vis the idea of understanding our role to go into failing states if we are. So I'm kind of curious how the panel feels about that because you're approaching it in a very static problem about being isolationist, again, mm -hmm. versus and, and seeing the world around us coming unglued in different parts of Latin America or even uh, Africa. And I'm curious how the panel feels about that. You want to go? You <laughs> <laughs> well, I have one, one sort of answer, which is we're only 5% of the world's population. We've got a fantastic military. We have have had a fantastic GNP, but we only have 5% of the world's population, so we are not going to be able to do all the things which need to be done. And there's, as you pointed out, a large number of failed states and maybe more on the way. Um, we haven't really ever interfered in the genocide, except maybe World War II. And I think what, one of the things we need to ask ourselves is not just do we have a fantastic military, which again I say we do, and we do have, we've got a, we've got a pretty good GNP, but we've only got a limited percent of the population. You've got India, you've got China, you've got all sorts of other countries with lots more people. We can't do all of the things which need to be done, and we need to ask ourselves which ones we are going to do and whether in fact they're a more important priority than the ones we're going to say can't do it. I think you can fight wars of choice. If you do it, you have to explain to the American people why you're doing it. You have to ensure uh, that you have some sort of legitimacy and in international thing. Uh, I think the first Persian Gulf War was a perfect war of choice. I mean, we went to the UN, we got the you know permission, uh, and we you know President then President Bush didn't exceed the UN mandate. We got contributions from the rest the rest the rest of the world. So yeah, you can fight wars of choice. Uh, Bush, or he never used the word, Ari Fleischer, his secretary, did that the war of necessity, but Wolfowitz, Powell, and Rumsfeld all said Iraq was a war of necessity, and I mean, that's what the, they sold the American people on. Now, it turned out that the reasons they gave were not quite true, I mean, but that's a whole, you know, other subject. But I doubt if Americans would have gone to Iraq if they didn't think it was a war of necessity had it not been portrayed as, as that. And, for the reasons that people did, they're going to have to, you know, deal with it. I mean, I get very upset uh, when uh, uh, Richard Haas did his, you know, uh, first art article before he did the book in the Washington Post in 2003, I guess it was, right after he left, saying, well, Iraq was really a war of, you know, choice. You know, wait a second, you didn't tell us that when you were there. It's too damn late now, you know. I mean, <laughs> that's what we, you know, need, need, need to know. And I quoted all of his bosses. You never disagree with them when you testified or anything like that. And that is annoying when you have people there. So, oh, it was really a choice. We didn't tell you. I mean, that's a whole other subject about ethics and government and things that, you know, people, people do. The other thing I'd say, since you raised this, I think our military leaders need, should have, put their foot down about deploying these people without sufficient time at home and said, look, you're obviously the commander, if you can do that, but I'm opposed to it and I will, you know, and instead they gloss over it. I saw General Casey on, they said, oh yeah, we can send more troops to, you know, Afghanistan. I'm thinking, wait a second, you told Congress that you wanted to give them 18 months at home, and, you know, I mean, so I think that they have to, now if the commander in chief still wants to do it, fine. But I think they need to, you know, make the American people aware of what you're doing. I don't have to tell you what the figures on PTSD and, you know, all of those are. This is outside my area of expertise <laughs> and current policy decisions. I mean, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is to think about the ways in which historically this move to a volunteer force created a set of problems and concerns that the military and society have had to deal with. And, you know, we, we fight wars with the military we have, and so it's very important, I think, to understand that military. But, you know, in, in terms of these decisions, uh, that's, that's in the world of policy and current politics, and, and I'm a historian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but just, let me just push it on a little bit. I mean, based on your, on your research, I mean, what do you think about the decision-making process within the military itself? I mean, how wide, how wide is the spectrum of opinion? How much possibility is there for people to raise concerns like time between deployments, that kind of thing? Again, that's not the kind of research I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Even, 
Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to start proclaiming about things that I haven't Right, said. no, I just thought maybe you uh, had let, some uh, Let thought. me say something yeah. about civilians, <laughs> which is, I think when they have a discussion with the military and they say, can you do this? The military says, yes, because of course they can do anything, and then to say all the things which would make it difficult, which a civilian ought to grasp is maybe no, or maybe more costly than you want, but that the civilians tend to hear only the first part, which says, we can. Mm -hmm. Well, let me get back to a point that's been raised here about people in high positions in their military uh, uh, experience. One night during the 2004 campaign I was on, Bill O'Reilly's show, and this was at the time they were talking about Bush's, uh, you know, draft record or joining the Guard, and he said to me, well, what difference do you think it would have made if Bush had not joined the Guard to get out of going to Vietnam and had he gone to Vietnam? I said, well, from my own experience, and I think if he did that, he would not have thought he would have been greeted as liberators. Okay, you see what I mean? So again, but you can't prepare a president, you know, for, you know, for, for everything given the, what comes on. But I do think, you know, if you had that experience, then you might, you know, uh, come at it a, a, a different way. Similarly, I think that you would understand, and this is where I do worry about, particularly with Democrats, that they will give in to the military because they don't want us to be seen as soft on defense, you know, and be able to stand up to them, whereas I think somebody who's been in the service, who doing that would recognize, you know, for example, what military mean, people mean when they say things and, you know, ask for more troops, and st just stuff like that. But it's gonna be hard because, you know, I doubt if the next president after President Obama is gonna be, you know, a product of, uh, you know, the draft or, you know, and, and any, any, anything like that. But I do think that that's certainly something that a man or woman could bring to, whether it's Congress or the presidency, having had that experience. I think, when, and I think it's great that they're trying to get a lot of veterans from Afghanistan and, and, and in Iraq to run for, you know, Congress and things like that, because I think they'll bring that perspective and say, wait a second, do you know what it's like when you go into a foreign country and think you're gonna be greeted as liberators? Let me tell you what it's, what it's really like. Is there a question? Uh, this is a great panel, I really didn't, <laughs> As long Please as you identify are, yourself. Jack, I, I'm getting right to you. Jack Hinman. I'm, I'm with the State Department now, but I was with the Army staff and the Corps of Engineers for a long time. And uh, I had some questions. I just, um, uh, you, you've already covered them before, I'd be glad to take it up, you know, offline afterwards. But uh, when the whole question came up, there was a big, you know, a big issue. The Army, the military really may be like completely sick of being at the forefront of social experimentation, integration, everything. And, and the all volunteer force may be uh, a better, uh, much better force. But the argument has always been raised that, uh, that it's better for the country, you know, character, characterologically, to have a draft and to have a, a, a form of universal service. And that may have been less important in the past that Americans were frontier people and they were wild and undisciplined and unruly, but they were also tough and strong and resourceful and, and may have always needed it, but they used you know, some disciplining and some teamwork. But they, the argument's made they need it more now. And the other question than they did in the past, and the other question I would have is, um, how far, my impression is that the U.S. Army, the military forces of the country are large enough that they sort of have, have a norming tendency and they're not really as far to the right of the population as many other armies are, are of their countries. That, that, that there is an occasional difference came out over gays, but by and large the U.S. military forces are moderately to the right, but not, not very far to the right of the, of the general population in their, uh, in their politics. And I'd be interested in how what you all think about that, and, and finally, if you think the something like the Westmoreland plan, where they were trying to avoid a call up without mobilizing guard and reserve div units before a division could be mobilized, if it, if it didn't prevent the Iraq War, but the idea was that it would force a debate, do you think something like that is a is is, is effective or not? Sorry, your first question was about the sir. The Sorry. draft is good for the country? Oh, the draft is good for the country. Some kind of service. Yes, yeah. And 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 that certainly is something people have discussed, but one of the time, it, at the moment when the Gates Commission was debating the, the move to the all-volunteer force, and they had been charged with coming up with a rationale for doing so in a plan, 
Um, one of the questions that was raised by this you know, group of 15 people who were, were debating the issue was whether or not by moving to a volunteer force the nation would lose the positive impact that military service had on its citizens. And um, so what was complicated is that the staff of this commission were economists who wanted to come up with quantitative data. And they worked very hard to come up with quantitative data that proved that military service was not an advantage afterwards in terms of, of your income. Um, and were able to demonstrate that to their satisfaction. But they were stuck when they were asked to demonstrate that military service didn't improve citizenship. And what they ended up doing was coming up with responses to Gallup poll questions, and I can't find what the questions were, and then demonstrating that military service didn't make you a better citizen because of what the answers were on the Gallup poll. Um, you know, th this is a bizarre way to approach the question, but they wanted to just say there, there really no significant advantages to the nation. But in the post-Cold War Army, um, as, as the uh, Army is shrinking by about a third and the question, the New U.S. News and World Report had a banner headline, you know, do we need an Army anymore? Uh, and as they're trying to answer the question, what, what the Army calculatedly tried to do was to say, we are a resource for the nation in times of peace. Um, we provide for national security, but we do a whole lot more. And their argument is we redeem young people, we make better citizens, we create better employees, um, and who was it? Um, I've forgotten who it was. It was a very high-ranking uh, person in the Department of Defense, essentially attributed to the strong economy in the late 1990s to the effect of military service, um, creating such good employees. And, and this was a very successful <coughs> marketing campaign, uh, that, that whole notion that this is one of the main things that the Army does, is to create better citizens, better employees, and to make young people who are potentially undisciplined into model citizens. So, yeah, it, it, it rises and falls, but it, it mainly happens when there's a sense that maybe the Army isn't as necessary, which is not something that people are talking about today. So if we go through another period of, I mean, certainly high deployments, but perceived extended peace, we'll probably get that kind of argument being made pretty powerfully again. Yeah. On your thing, it, it's uh, Abrams, I think you're referring to, who, General Abrams, who succeeded Westmoreland both in, in Vietnam as well as as Army Chief of Staff. And the myth is, so he denies it, and you know <coughs> that, well, we'll put the army so dependent on the guard and reserve that you can't, you know, even put out brush fires without mobilizing the guard and reserve, and that will get people's attention. Well, even assuming if that was true, it doesn't work under a volunteer military because the people in the guard and reserve have also volunteered; they're not being forced to go, and unlike. The 60s, you don't have the nation's elite going in. I mean, that's what Johnson was afraid of. If he mobilized them, you'd have had, you know, George then, Bush. you know, George Bush and Bill Bradley and, you know, the New York Knickerbockers would have been calling up and saying, you're ruining our, you know, attendance, you know, and, and all of that, uh, that, that type of thing. So I think, you know, it, it hasn't worked that way. My concern, basically, is we're overusing both the active and the guard. That's, the, that's another issue because we don't want to go to, you know, the, why we keep people to register. And I, I think, as a nation, I, I, I'm ashamed of us that, you know, and our politicians will not step up to the plate. I'm just saying, they voted to go to war in Iraq. Okay, do something about it. Um, and the question about whether the military is further to the right than is less, well, less far mean, to the, the right the than data you. seems to well I mean if you look at where they're recruited from and everything like that they would tend to be more conservative than the general population and as I say there's a the Air Force has had a lot of trouble with evangelicals out there and you know things like that so you do you do you do see that and I think they are more conservative in terms of their position on a lot of you know social issues and things like that um, I don't think it's a great problem. I think you have to be careful because every now and then they get carried away, you know, and uh, at some of these, uh, uh, some of these uh, things. But no, by and large, I, I think you have to recognize, it, and that's what you're going to get, because those are the people who are attracted to the military. Uh, 
Um, I just want to ask one last question because I know Beth um, wrote this book as a historian and was, and and also sees it as a reflection on the post-Vietnam period. And I wonder if you have some final thoughts about that. I, I mean, this your book is a history of of this period as in general, in more general terms. I think I was surprised as I started researching this book uh, at how much the struggles of the post-Vietnam era were played out in the military and by the, I mean, often enormous levels of sophistication that the military brought to trying to deal with these problems, often without success and sometimes with success. but. I think that trying to tell the story of post-Vietnam America without putting the military in an important position domestically, not only in terms of international relations, we're missing a critical piece of the story. And um, you know, I agree with what Judith said. We need to make the study of the military a much more fundamental part of our academic endeavors today and our education of our young people, whether they're engaged in the military or not. Well, I'm sure this book is going to go a long way toward making that happen. So thank you very much for writing the book, for allowing us to discuss it. Thanks Great to our job. panelists. Please join.